and welcome to another edition of Turn Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham. Once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, I, t- I say it to him, I think he's one of the most, if not the most influential musician of all time because of he's done everything. He's done everything. Danny Elfman is on the show today. You may know him from Oingo Boingo. You may know him from the Mystic Knights of Oingo Boingo. You may know him from a legendary gong show appearance. Uh, or you may know him from the fact that he's done every, like I could just name all the uh, stuff he's done as a composer for various TV and film things. And we could spend the whole podcast doing that. But anyway, he is here on the show in celebration of his monster of a new album, Big Mess. It's 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 a wild record. We'll be talking about that in a second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedoutabunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham. Thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do on this thing, buddy. I love you. Tristan Tristan works for this thing. Tristan works for free, mind you, but Tristan does definitely work for this thing. So I, I love you, buddy. Thank you for everything you do for this podcast. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Left for Damien. Tristan also runs a Turned Out of Punk Instagram page as well as a Facebook page um, that you can find him over there as well. If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling all your friends about it, letting everyone know that you know that we do this podcast and we we, we have some... Uh, a wide range of guests here talking about punk rock. Um, you can also support the show by subscribing to it and rating it on iTunes or the platform that you're listening to it on. And thank you. Thank you to everyone that does do that. I very much appreciate it. You can also support the show by heading over to patreoncom slash turned out of punk and checking out the fun stuff we do over there, like footnotes and, and, uh, the other things, surprise episodes, secret episodes, all, all sorts of stuff over there. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that does that. Uh, and speaking of thanks, I got to give thanks to the kind folks at Vans who came aboard a few years ago and said, Damien, we love what you do. Just, just don't do it out of your own pocket anymore. And they helped me cover the cost of this thing. And it is very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you to Vans for doing that. And uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll be doing House of Vans again soon. That's my goal. My goal in life is to return to doing these House of Vans parties. Those are some of my favorite memories ever when Vans throws these parties all over the city right now, all over, all over the city, all over cities, all over the world. And occasionally I get to go and do Turn Out of Punk episodes there. And I miss doing that very much, very much. Check out Channel 66, by the way, which is uh, Vans thing over there on YouTube. A lot of buddies, friends of the show, past guests, future guests, on there playing music, talking about music and, uh, yeah, fun hang, man. I miss fun hangs. I miss fun hangs in person very much, very much, but hopefully we'll get back there soon. All right. Uh, check out fucked up's year of the horse over there on uh fucked up band camp. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Nothing else. Uh, nothing else. If you haven't ever watched the wrestlers, that TV show I did about pro, pro wrestling, uh, check it out over there on streaming services or somewhere on the internet. If you look up vice, the wrestlers, it'll come up. I, I, I'm always shocked. People are hitting me up being like, Hey, I just saw this thing. The wrestlers that you did. I'm like, I talked about that thing so much. You never saw it. Anyway, check it out. I'm very proud of that. Very proud of that. Speaking of being proud, I'm very proud of this week's show. Cause today on the show, a legend, a goddamn legend, Danny Elfman is here. Danny Elfman, of course, as we mentioned off the top is someone that you, if you do not know by name, you certainly know by musical composition, be it, Songs for the Simpsons, Edward Scissorhands, Tales from the Crypt. Like, just, I, honestly, I don't want to get into that because we could just be talking about it forever. He's finally put out a new solo record after years and years, and it's been years since he did Oingo Boingo stuff as well, and it's called Big Mess, and this thing is a monster of an album. 18 tracks coming out on Ante, and Tristan was like, yo, we got to get Danny Elfman on the show. I said, absolutely, and here we are. Here we are. This might be the only episode where I don't think I actually ask, how'd you hear about punk rock? It was a a bit of a technical issue in the very beginning, and uh, I don't think we ever got back to it, but uh, it's it's an amazing conversation nonetheless with a legend, a legend. Um, And I think that's it. Oh, later in the episode, he says Steve Bannon, but I think it's because we were talking politics just before, and he means Bruce Banner. 
because we're talking about the Hulk. But anyway, I just noticed that uh, slip in the show, and I always want to clarify that I don't think he thinks that uh, Steve Bannon is the Incredible Hulk at all. Anyway, you'll, it'll make sense when you get to that part. Uh, that's it. I don't think there's anything else uh, to get to. This is a fun one, um, a brief one, but, a, but an action-packed one. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Danny Elfman on Turned Out a Punk. <laughs> Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, I was actually talking with some friends today, and we kind of came to the conclusion that you are probably the most influential artist of of our lifetime. You know, just because. <laughs> oh my god, I I that's like weird to hear that. That's scary. <laughs> well, it's funny. I consider but... myself the most influential human, only to my dog. <laughs> Well, your dog and musicians around the world, because your songs are almost like, it's almost like folk songs would be to another generation. Like I can, I can hum a couple bars of compositions you've written to my kids and, and they'll, they'll know immediately what it is. Like it's, it's the same way I guess hymns would be or different sort of like cultural (sighs) kind of touchstones in different eras. Your songs have kind of become that in a weird way. Well, thank you so much. I mean, gee, I, <laughs> I, uh, I have never heard it like that before, but um, I appreciate it. Well, I and I also now I'm going to unfortunately have to heap a little more praise on you because indirectly, uh, well, sorry, separate from that, you've also had a massive influence on a number of people that have come on this podcast through Oingo Boingo and directly kind of through the early period of Oingo Boingo when you guys were kind of like an LA punk band at that first sort of explosion of Los Angeles punk. There's been quite a few people that have come on that have wound up doing other bands like no effects and whatnot that talk about your band being just so influential in sort of that initial jump off period. That's so crazy to hear. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's sweet. Um, I, of course, you know, you never know at the time when there's just a bunch of kids out in the audience that <laughs> some of those kids are going to go on and have like big careers themselves. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a strange thing to think about, isn't it? Oh, it's very bizarre. Like I, I'm fascinated by that period of Los Angeles. If you look at the people that were in these rooms and sometimes, you know, you were there, obviously I wasn't, but there were fewer than a hundred people, you know, th- and, and, yet all those people would wind up doing other bands or creating yeah. other arts or film, you know, and, and, and just influence culture. Well, it's, you know, it was an interesting period. Let me put it that way. Uh, I was lucky in so far as that out of the blue in the late seventies, I decided, you know, to start a band out of, the, I, I was already in a troupe. I was in a musical theatrical troupe and I thought I had my future all set but I didn't realize how totally schizo I was until I woke up one morning and I heard Ska playing from England. And yeah. uh, I don't know if it was the selector or the specials. And um, I said, you know what? What I've been doing the last eight years, I think I'm just going to stop it and start a Ska band. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was like, okay. Um, and I just did. But it was lucky to be in the in a really interesting time in LA and uh the cool thing about that scene then is that there was no scene mm-hmm. there wasn't a sound uh you know we quickly built up a following and we would play clubs every weekend um Madame Wong's East Madame Wong's West the Whiskey a Go-Go the Roxy you know two or three others it was almost like a circuit of clubs and and just about every weekend we would be at one club or the other and we might leave a note we'd be at the Roxy and the Go-Go's or I'd leave a note for Belinda from the Go-Go's or you know it's like oh leave a note for X scene's gonna be here next from X it's like it was such a strange <clears throat> collection of bands um you had us you had X, which was like my favorite group in the world. It's still one of my favorite groups. I mean, I, I used to literally run from our sets at Madame Wong's Chinatown to the Hong Kong Cafe where X was playing in between our two sets to catch half an hour of their set. Then I'd run back and start our next set. <laughs> and um, then you had like Fear, Wall of Voodoo. Um, you had... Uh, 
you know, all playing the same kind of uh, circuits. I think Los Lobos was starting up around that time. It, it was really, there was no common denominator between all of us. There was nothing, if you listen to like six of the most popular bands in L.A. at the time, um, you'd go, I don't get it. There's nothing <laughs> in common there, musically. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the difference between fear and and Wall of Voodoo, and X, and Oingo Boingo, and the Go-Go's. Um, other than there was a lot of energy, but the what we were doing was also totally different. And um, it was just an interesting time. And so the clubs were really vibrant. And um, still, uh, years later, when we were playing bigger venues, um, those were my favorite performing days. I, I never topped the feeling that uh, we had in those clubs, you know, those three to 500 seat clubs that were packed and sweaty. And I loved that. I loved it hot and sweaty. And um, there was a crush of people to the front of the stage and there was no, no distance between me and them, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then later you go, okay, well, there's a pit here and there's security in the pit. (laughs) You know, it's it's a very different vibe. But uh, I always missed that. And there was this thing that I always really loved, like towards the end of the set, because, you know, the sets were long and intense, and I'd be covered with sweat. And um, I remember I'd sing a song, and I'd have my guitar, and I'd wave my hand, and I'd see like four little streams of sweat flying off the four fingers, you know, that were going by. And it could almost make like, kind of weird kind of patterns with the sweat pouring off them off of my fingers. And um, I missed that later, you know, it just never was quite like that again. Well, you know, you bring up an amazing thing about that scene, like, yeah, pre-codification of punk rock, the stuff that was all happening in the, in between Madame Wong's and the Hong Kong cafe, it's like the screamers. Well, it's like, it's yeah, just so and then much. You, you had like the punk bands too. I mean, there was another whole system of clubs that would be playing, um, you know, Black Flag and, uh, you know, all, all the punk bands. So it's like kind of they had a network of clubs that were just like the, the real punk. And then there was these clubs that we were playing that were like ill-defined. But <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you wouldn't necessarily, it, it would just be kind of playing a mishmash of everything, I guess. I, I think to me it all feels like, you know, and once again, I have the benefit of, of- you know, looking at it from a different perspective, I guess, being so far away from it, but it feels like it is sort of that same energy. Like obviously it's being taken up really differently. And it's, it's interesting you bring up black flag because, you know, both Kathy and Jane from the go-go's and and a lot of people have talked about their arrival and sort of the oncoming of hardcore being when that amazing diverse scene kind of stops and the new sort of like capital P punk scene, much more aggressive, macho ultimately scene begins to kind of take over. Yeah, I mean, I I can't even really speak to that just because I'm such a poor cultural historian. (laughs) You know, it's almost like I wasn't even barely aware of the larger context of being a part of anything. I just knew that, okay, here we're going. We're, We're living week to week and we're starting to earn just enough money that I could consider quitting my waiter job. <laughs> you know, so that's where my mind was at that moment. It's like, oh my God, if I just earn a hundred dollars more per week, I don't have to wait tables, you know, three, four nights a week still. Yeah. So well, that, that's where I was at. And this is already so far into your like, even though you're super young at this point, this is so far into your musical journey. Like you've You've already well, been this was my second, around the world. No, it's already been my second career also. Because, you know, I spent eight years doing this kind of weird musical, kind of crazy cabaret street theater uh, before I started the band. So it's like Oingo Boingo was not my first career. It was my second. Because I remember it's like, oh, yeah, well, I mean, I definitely can't start a punk band because I'm already 27. I'm old. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, punk band, you do that when you're 17, not when you're an old 27 year old. And so I already felt like, you know, I'm a senior citizen of the scene. It's like, I'm actually going to be 30 in three years. It's like, I'm over, 
<laughs> well, but you already had gone to France too and done the stuff with Le Grand Magic Circus, right? Like that was you well, played that's when I was like a, a kid. I was eighteen years old, and I got hired on a total fluke to do a quick tour with uh, Le Grand Magic Circus in Paris, and then I spent a year in West Africa. And by the time I got back, my brother Richard had already begun the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo as a street troupe inspired by Le Grand Magic Circus. And I was appointed musical director. I mean, literally, he like he came to the house the day after I got home with hepatitis after being gone for a year, and um, he like drove me to a rehearsal. I go, Rick, I'm like, I could barely move. He goes, No, 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 I know you don't have to do much. It's okay. I understand you'll be healing up for a few weeks, but you could just start listening in because you're the musical director now. I was like, oh, okay. So it's not like I, we talked about it. It was more like, this is your new job. You'll start as soon as you're feeling better. I said, but that's okay. amazing. Sorry, go on. No, I mean, that's it. You know, it's like musical director of a street troupe that passed the hat. You know, it wasn't like I was musical director of some Broadway show. I mean, we'd literally spent four years on the streets and I, uh, I learned to play trombone. As I had been playing violin in, in Africa the year before. I learned violin that year. But then I started getting into percussion and uh, trombone. And, but I also had to learn to become a fire breather because part of being a street performer is like, you got to do everything. And it's like, okay, play a song, play, a, play another song. Now pull out a torch and blow flames over people's heads. But, you know, that was That's my, amazing. That, that's what I did. Did you ever bring that into Oingo Boingo? Did you ever blow fire in the early days? No, because you don't want to do that in a club. <laughs> no, I've seen it go wrong. I've definitely <laughs> yeah. watched that go horribly wrong. Yeah, exactly. That's something you do in the streets. And we, we, we had this special technique down because my brother, he wore this big rocket ship kind of contraption over his shoulders, which sprayed uh, CO2 smoke, you know, like vapor out the back. like the. <laughs> but the real reason for that is like me and another guy were blowing fire. Sometimes you start little fires on people's shoulders or on their heads <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, little drops would appear on clothes and he was always watching for it and he would blast them immediately with the fire extinguisher. As soon as he saw, you know, there'd be somebody kind of watching, smiling and he would see like, there's a little fire on this guy's sweater on his back. He doesn't even know it. That's amazing. It, it really feels like uh, Le Grand Magic Circus kind of had, you know, like it's it's sort of this like theater of confrontation, like this whole this whole like new approach to democratizing performance where it's no longer it's like it's like a, a whole new way approach to art. It feels like yeah. The, I mean, the, the the Magic Circus shows were insane. Uh, every now and then, uh, I'd be on stage. It was a big troupe. There were like twenty people in it. And uh, my brother was the conga drummer. You know, it was through him that I kind of came in contact with them. And every now and then there'd be a riot in the theater. They'd be playing these big places. But, you know, things would get political. And uh, it, there'd, like, be a riot and chairs would start flying. <laughs> and uh, he would grab me and say, get, get your violin back. Get your violin out of the way. You know, he was afraid, like, a chair was going to crush my violin. And uh, <laughs> But, you know, it, it would be crazy. I, I, I mean, literally... People would get offended so easy, and politics was everywhere. And mm -hmm. um, I remember, like, after a show in Nice or Lyon one night, and it's like, I'm starving, and I'm exhausted, and I haven't eaten all day. And we go, like, 20 of us into this takeover an entire restaurant and ordering these steaks and fries and waiting for them to come out, and I'm just salivating. And suddenly, one of the Argentinian members of the cast is screaming with a waiter, and uh, he was insulted, and he stands up, and then everybody else stands up. And I go to my brother, I said, what the fuck? And he goes, well, <laughs> we have to leave. What? He goes, uh, so-and-so was offended, we're leaving. I go, but I haven't eaten. He goes, Danny, you have to leave. I go, oh, shit. <laughs> it's like, and it's like, I'm just looking back there thinking of, like, my dinner, and it's like, no, we're outraged. The waiter offended, uh, uh, you know. Manuel, and uh, we all have to support him, and off we go. And so we did. So that kind of shit, it was crazy. It was just complete madness. I've heard it brought up in the same way that people bring up Warhol and the factory as like a precursor to American punk. Like it feels like it occupies very much a similar sort of space of of being sort of that energy that would be kind of taken up by punk, but like in, in a very obviously different context. Well, yeah, I mean, it was weird because it was European so it was very political. 
you know, everything uh, in France in the 60s and the 70s, you know, it was like highly politically charged. So, mm. you know, it was it was crazed in that way. But it had that energy for sure. It had that definitely that energy. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, the year I spent in Africa, the, I loved the music I listened to. It was called High Life. Yeah. And, um, but it didn't... Uh, it wasn't performance-wise something that is like, oh, I'd, I'd want to do that because, you know, it was kind of reggae and salsa-inspired. It was wonderful. But when I heard ska, when I heard Madness, it was like, oh, my God, that's like high life on steroids, on mm-hmm. adrenaline. Mm-hmm. That appeals to me because that's what I needed. I needed something like twice the tempo. And uh, suddenly it's like that connected with me. And it was uh, it, it just made perfect sense because the one thing I knew is that when I got out there, it's like I had a lot of adrenaline. I still don't know what to do with it. I never figured that part out. You know, it's like uh, I remember throughout my career, I'd listen to live recordings and go, God damn, did I really count it off that fast? <laughs> I was just, you know, in my head, I'd be going one, two, one, two, three, four. But in fact, I'd be going one, two, one, two, three, four. And it's like, it just didn't feel like that. And, uh, you know, it was it was madness, and uh, not the band Madness, which was definitely an inspiration for me. But you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you definitely hear that in Cruel Composition too. Like that that adrenaline is is there. Like all the songs have like kick me. There's just sort of like this energy, and obviously that comes through in all your works. You know, like but I think that that definitely in this new album. Well, you know, the funny thing in the new album is there were always two competing sides to me when I was with Oingo Boingo. And no matter what I did, I was, half of me was really unhappy with it. And um, it was like a war all the time. It's like, and every two years, I wanted to be in a different band completely. And that's not a good thing when you're in a band. You know, it's not fair to the audience. It's like, I never wanted to play my old stuff. I always, I was <laughs> only interested in playing new songs. And it's like, shit, I don't want to play Only a Lad. It's like, that. that's four years old. <laughs> damn. And it's like, but that's what people are here for. I said, okay, I get it. I get it. But I just wasn't good at that. And, um, so finally I realized I I have to get out of this. It's making me insane. Um, but when I became a film composer, I realized that same energy worked to my advantage because the desire to go in all these different directions, no matter what I do, I want to follow it with something the opposite. It's like, that worked for me because in films you can be doing something like really huge, aggressive score followed by something very romantic, followed by a really big scale epic thing, followed by something tiny, a little $1 million movie. And you're only got money for like eight players, which is fine. And uh, followed by something ridiculous, you know, an absurd. So, it was that constant ability to bounce, bang, 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 that kept me going. And um, when I sat down and started to write Big Mess unintentionally, um, I discovered that, wow, those two sides of me, far from being subdued, uh, had actually become more clearly isolated and defined from one another. And when I was doing movies, they just one would just sit there fuming like waiting his turn. It's like, oh, you write write this silly, stupid piece of shit so I can get to something heavy and something beautiful or something deep. And then I'd be writing something darker and deeper. And the other side, I was like, oh, just finish this piece of crap so I can just let out some energy and write something crazy and wild. And so no matter what I was doing, there's part of me is like, get over this and get to the next thing so I can have my turn. So when I started writing, everything started coming out in pairs. Um, the first song I wrote was Sorry, uh, which was pretty heavy. And I mean, I couldn't believe when I opened my mouth and started doing lyrics, the venom I had in me was pretty intense. And then the next song I write is Happy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, a little bit of contrast there. Then the next song I write is True. And it's like, oh, fuck, man, that's the darkest thing. Where the fuck did that come from? And the next thing I write is Kick Me. And it's like, oh, all right, uh, I guess. So it was really weird because uh, by the time I had six songs, I was already, all right, this is definitely going to be a side A, side B kind of thing because it's like, this is like really schizo. 
And uh, of course, by the time I reached 18 songs, I go, all right, a little bit too much for side A, side B. How about disc one, disc two kind of thing? And uh, But it was really interesting. It was not conscious and it wasn't intentional. It was just the way they came out. But it was crazy because it was like opening a Pandora's box. And I, I really was only going to write a couple of songs. And it was only because I'd written this song, Sorry, for Coachella. And I still had that thing in me of like, I'd been rehearsing with this band, which I loved. And we were starting to sound really good. So when the pandemic hit and I just had to bury myself, I went out, I have a house out of town and my family and I went up there and said, well, we'll just sit it out for a month or two. And didn't realize that I'd be there for a year. But um, it was like, I don't even have a studio here. All, all I got is a little writing room, little, really modest little room. I have a computer. I got one microphone. I got one guitar. And suddenly, I'm off and running. And it's like, fuck it. That's all I need. I got an electric guitar. I got a microphone. I kind of have a voice. And I'll just see what happens. And it was crazy because uh, I didn't know where it was coming from. It was It was so unexpected, but I realized I did have a lot of frustration and anger and venom and sadness all mixed together, you know, in the isolation and mixed with where America was in 2020. I mean, holy fuck, what a place. Mm-hmm. Um, not in my wildest dreams could I have imagined living in this kind of dystopian reality that felt like it was more something that should be like a series on Hulu or Netflix, you know, about an America that never was with this maniac uh, Donald Trump (laughs) that I'd always thought was like a maniac idiot my whole life. I mean, way before he got into politics and I go as president, I go, yeah, exactly. That's the comedy, right? That's the, that's the story uh, for this fictional thing and it was reality and it was this constant sense of this can't be real there's no possible way this can be real and here it was so yeah i had a lot of shit rolling around in my head it it, like you know it it feels like it would have been kind of reminiscent of what 68 69 into the early 70s would have been like like you know obviously you know in california post manson even going to france post 1968 with the situationist like it feels like things haven't been this much in flux since kind of that time period. Yeah, but that was different because I was around for that. And see, it's a very different thing because that was just polarized politics, which I totally understand. And certainly it's the same now, but it was never revolving around a single authoritarian kind of character where it was an idolized situation that wasn't wasn't about principle it was about whatever he says it was more reminiscent of germany 1929 when Mm -hmm. nobody believed that people would actually through a a democratic system hand it over to uh an authoritarian kind of crazy guy yeah you know it's like they didn't think it could happen and it did and so I'm not comparing Trump with Hitler, by the way. So let's get that straight. There's no comparison. Mm -hmm. But what I'm, and the funny thing is, I'm not even angry at Trump. You know, he's just a sociopath, crazy guy. He was no different than he was 10 years or 20 years ago. Um, He's always been a nut, a sociopath, a a crazy guy, the kind of person that I would go, you know, a a fucking media clown. And uh, the anger I had was towards the the party that enabled him you know he he should have just been like a crazy fringe player off in the side you know they're the ones that made it real not him he was just being himself you know what i mean yeah no it's much more comparable to charles manson where it's like he's someone who's filled a spiritual void in these followers lives and can say things and suggest things and then stuff is done in his name well absolutely and and then what i was feeling was that how easily a democracy can fold in on itself Mm. it's like, I mean, we're even seeing it now. It hasn't stopped. You know, you've got 
still 70 percent of Republicans believing that the election was stolen and that Trump won by landslide. Now, they don't need any evidence. So there's nothing being uncovered by journalists, by uh, anybody doing any research of having a reason other than that's what he says. And that's where it comes down to, like, the dictator kind of uh, sense of Idi Amin. I was in Uganda when Idi Amin was there, and uh, they called him at that point, oh, he's just a clown, he's a buffoon. And um, people talking about him talked about him the way that we talked about Donald Trump in the beginning. It's like, nah, it's, don't take it seriously. He's just saying crazy stuff, but don't take it seriously. Uh, you know, he's not going to do any of that stuff. He's not, he doesn't really believe it, probably even. Who knows? He's just a, he's just a nut. And because, uh, you know, he was already doing conspiracy theories, you know, in the very beginning. It started with the birther thing, you know, right, right from the, the get-go. And uh, it was like crazy, like, like, and then people would say, don't, don't take I mean seriously. And within a year after I got home, you're reading about, oh, that's it, that their entire system just collapsed. And um, I'm watching this going in the beginning, the same thing. Oh, don't, don't take it seriously. Don't take it seriously. And then it's like, no, it, it, it's real. It's like people really buy into it doesn't matter what he says. It's whatever he says. It's a personality cult. It's nothing to do with politics. So in that regards, there's no relationship to the 60s because people weren't wrapped up into Nixon in the same way. If Nixon said something, conservatives wouldn't just buy it automatically. You know, if Nixon said something crazy, conservatives would go, well, wait a minute, that's crazy. When Nixon got caught, you know, pulling this shit with Watergate, uh, most conservatives turned on him. So it was a very, very different time. They said, this, this isn't okay. Uh, it's not okay to do this stuff. You know, it's like, this is a, you have to like withhold the, the oath of the office, and, you know, in the honorable position that it's supposed to be in. So it was very, very different, hugely divided in terms of uh, the politics, you know, and the protest movements, which I remember uh, at the time, but not based around a single cult of personality. Like mm. Nixon was not Donald Trump. And you know what? Nixon wasn't out to like, kind of hijack a democracy and turn it into like a different system where voting didn't really count and you don't trust the vote and you don't trust the government. You, you know, Nixon was just a whole different animal. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I could, you know, 100% see that. But anyhow, it's... look, we're talking about politics now. So <laughs> don't get me <laughs> but... going. I, you know, I'll go off on this shit forever. It's just, well... I've seen a lot in my lifetime and going between Nixon and the 60s to where we are today, it's just like, I found myself in 2020 when I started doing the big mess, you know, literally talking with my wife about like, we have two choices. We either like move to England or Canada or New Zealand or Australia, an English speaking country, or do we bubble up in California and just pretend it's our own country and the rest of the country doesn't exist? You know, how do we deal with this? And it will now it's shifted too, right? Because now you know, like, look, the the election is over and there's still state houses that are trying to change voting laws right now. Like, it's not, it's like oh, no, such that's what a I mean. shift. The hijacking of the system is not at all over. Yeah. It's in full swing. You know, it's like we will gain power any way we can. And so we're trying to suppress votes. So what? It's like yeah. this sense of like, we don't give a shit. It's like, fuck this democracy. It's like the less people who vote, the better for us. And it's like, where does this come from? That's crazy. I mean, I heard the arguments in Pennsylvania. It's like outraged that they added extra days for the mail-in votes. But you're going, people are angry that more votes are being counted? Yeah. It's like, isn't that kind of... The whole point of democracy is that you do everything possible to get every vote that you possibly can get, everybody voting. You make it as easy as possible because you want everybody to vote. It's like, where did this become okay? It's like, no, we want to 
disqualify votes. We want to like expel these votes. We want to cut off these votes. It's like, and they're open about it. That's what's incredible. It's like, it's not even disguised. It's like, no, it just, uh, we don't want everybody voting. And especially we want to make it harder in inner cities, in urban areas. Uh, it's it's a politics of disenfranchisement. You know, they just feel like they're, this is the move to get people not to want to vote. And then you can kind of control a democracy. It just feels, but this is stuff that people in these bands have been singing about forever. You know, like yeah. it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the bread and butter of, of this kind of music. I know. It, it's just like, it's weird. About a year ago, it was when the Black Lives Matter thing was happening. And I started like going on my Instagram and, and kind of getting really vocal about it. And, Everybody started warning me, Danny, don't step into this. Don't do it. You're going to lose half your audience. And I started getting a lot of hate mail. But I got into this one argument with this one guy who was a Trump supporter. And he's like, I was your biggest fan. Now it's like, you know, I realize you're an asshole. It's like, what are you doing? You shouldn't be getting into politics. You have no business turning music into politics. And I wrote him back and I said, if this was about conservative versus liberal, it would be a whole different ball game because all my life I've argued with conservatives and usually it's two sides passionately presenting something they really believe. And there's truth to both sides. You either believe in, you, you side with one or you side with the other. But I've had great arguments with conservatives over the years that were really, you know, what they're saying was not bullshit. It's just like, I may disagree with it, but there's like solid reasons for them believing what they believed. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. that's called debate. And, um, and I told him, I said, this isn't about debate. This is about hijacking a democracy because it's not about ideas. It's just about a single individual. It's about worship. And it's about buying into like a world of crazy conspiracy shit that has no basis in reality. So this has nothing like what it should be, which is the two of us having an honest debate about the role of government in society and whether bigger government, smaller government, bigger spending, smaller spending. That's always been what liberal conservative arguments have been about. And that's all really valid stuff. But this isn't that. And I have to get involved. I have no choice. It's like, this is the time where you have to fucking speak out. You know, and they said the same thing about sports figures. It's like, hey, just play the fucking game and shut up. And you can't do that now. I mean, I look at what LeBron James and, and other guys are doing and I go, it's so, you know, it, it's so necessary. And uh, really since Muhammad Ali, it's like, no, everything's about society and culture and making the country better. It's all there. It's like if you're a public figure like that, you have to speak out. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I thought Muhammad Ali had changed that and uh, for sports figures. And yet we saw the same thing the last few years. It's like, shut up and play ball. It's like this is nothing to just keep keep away from it. Well, yeah, it feels like education has failed in in informing these people properly. So it's almost like culture and pop culture and it has to step in there and, and do the educating for people. Like, just be like, here's how it's actually going because people have not been informed properly to kind of think that, that this, you know, like it just feels like there's no baseline anymore. And it's just, you make up your own news or you follow someone making up their own news and that's your reality. Well, it's true. And it's like, Arguing with somebody who's a flat earther or arguing with somebody who's into QAnon, it's like you can't argue yeah. when everything comes down to a conspiracy that's so big that it's everybody. So you can't trust anybody because all the scientists are in on this conspiracy that the earth is round and all the press is in on this conspiracy that, you know, the world isn't being controlled by these kind of weird pedophiles and that drink baby blood or yeah. god knows it's like it's like what the fuck are you guys talking about it's like give me a break so it, it's it, it's insane times but in the same time you know it's like as i start writing there's still like a sarcastic crazy side of myself that's never gone away and uh 
is out there just like kind of prodding and poking fun. But, you know, it's like, um, it's been a crazy year. Let me just put it that way. I was sitting down to write an orchestral commission for the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain that was going to premiere at the proms in 2020 in August. And I realized the proms aren't going to happen. They haven't canceled, but nothing's going to happen. There's not going to be any concerts. It's all going to cancel. And I, I kind of lost my, my energy for that at the moment. I said, it might not be for another year or two. Who knows? And that's when I started like, I'll just try a couple of songs, see what happens. And suddenly the big mess appears and it was a big mess. <laughs> Had you like written songs like in the interim, like ever? Because like obviously the the last you know ninety four, like obviously you've been writing music the whole way through. I mean, but like, had you attempted writing a, like a solo record in between? You no, know? no, no. I mean, I've written songs for movies, you know, yeah. like musicals, and I wrote a song, uh, a kind of a rock song for this film, Wanted, uh, about I don't know, I don't know how many years ago, and you know, and that was just like a fun song, but no, I haven't written from and for myself uh since the you know mid 90s probably 93 94 i mean 95 was our last album but that yeah uh was already like a live uh farewell album so it was no longer new material i i i'm guessing like 93 was the last time i wrote uh actually fresh material I've asked a couple of people that have been on the show that also do you know composition work as well like do you find the process different like to be in different, you have to be in different headspaces to do these two kind of because like I, I I play in a band and I've never done composition work obviously but I still find that they would be kind of very different thought processes from the outside. Uh, it's about as different as different can be. It really yeah. is like trying to like bang my head against the wall because right after Big Mess I went right into writing a cello concerto, um, and uh kind of changing the headspace there was really brutal for a while. It's kind of like trying to, you're the Hulk and you're trying to get Steve Bannon back <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. It's not always that easy to do. Um, I, uh, it's a really different place. It's a really different place. You know, when, when I'm writing orchestrally, it takes this intense concentration because the music's so fucking hard <laughs> it's difficult i'm i'm holding on to really complicated ideas but when i'm writing songs it's the opposite um i'm trying to really clear my head and find like my own subconscious like what's trying to get out and um it's it's really not a very compatible thing in my mind at least the style of writing that I do on one side and the other doesn't have a lot of overlap other than the fact that, you know, I tried bringing orchestra into my rock and roll writing because that was this concept that I had back in 2019 when I, I had this idea, uh, which I, tr I sold to a, a, a music festival in Tasmania called Dark Mofo and I wanted to go there. And I said, you know, I have this idea for, I'll, I don't know what to call it. I'll call it chamber punk. But I have a piece of music in my head, and it's what became Sorry. And it involves nine female voices, a chamber orchestra, and a rock band, and a shit ton of percussion. Yeah. And they were like, okay. But I couldn't come up with a whole show. I came up with like a 10-minute piece of music. The, originally, I'm so sorry, had I wasn't singing on. I was just playing guitar. And then when Coachella happened... That's where I said, I, I'm turning this into a song. And, uh, and that's where I kind of opened that floodgate of venom that was just like sitting there waiting to get out. And it was shocking even to me. It's like, like I, I really didn't feel like I was controlling it at all. It really feels like this is almost like a throwback then to the Mystic Knights of Oingo Boingo, where you do have this sort of maximalist approach to music, like obviously sonically completely different, but like how many people were in Mystic Knights when you were kind of trying to put that together? Like I've seen videos where it looks like there's 12 people on stage, 15 people yeah, on stage. Well, no, that's absolutely right. We were 12. Uh, yeah, the Mystic Knights was kind of more closer to scoring in a weird way, but you know, we did a lot of uh, 
I started doing original compositions. So that was my first composing, and it was how I taught myself to write music. Um, but I also did a lot of old jazz. I really loved jazz in that period. And um, so I was obsessed with Duke Ellington. And um, I kind of taught myself music by deconstructing Duke Ellington songs and learning how to transcribe them. But yeah, it was definitely kind of way closer to the composition mindset than the rock band mindset where everything's visceral and you know it's like coming from your gut and uh it's not about the composition it's like you just let this thing out it's letting an animal out of a cage it's it's a funny too because that very first single that you do you got your baby back that's that's about patty hearst right the song the record well okay but see that wasn't even oingo boingo that was the mystic Nights. mystic Nights. sorry that's what i meant the mystic Nights. so the very first mystic Nights record sorry that's that's about patty yeah. hearst though it was already sarcastic even back then but it, it's amazing how that's kind of echoing the themes we're talking about now which is just sort of this the way that people can be obviously there's a lot of abuse also in the patty hearst situation but just how people can be kind of consumed and kind of taken out of their their lives and put into different situations and ultimately we're seeing that you know like you talk not to get back on the politics but like what you're saying with politics like how we're seeing how people are are brainwashed now on a mass level so you were addressing those themes even on your first compositions well yeah i mean look i always when i was putting together the show for coachella I was looking back at early Oingo Boingo songs, but I wanted the show to be very political. I, I was looking for songs that kind of evoke a dystopian sensibility. And I was surprised there were so many of them. There was like plenty of stuff to choose from. So I, it's weird because 40 years ago, I was already thinking about this kind of fascist or dystopian kind of craziness, but I never thought it would happen. But I always felt like it was there. Um, I just didn't think in my lifetime that it would move from the fringe to the mainstream. Uh, well, Danny, this has been incredible. And anytime you want to come back on this show and talk politics, punk, whatever you want to talk about, high life, please know the door is always open. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. It was fun. I'm, I'm sorry I got so kind of wound up and off the mark because that's, you know, <laughs> that's my mind. You know, once I get started, it's really hard to shut me up. Um <laughs> And uh, I don't give great interviews because of that, because I just go off. And then I realize later, it's like, what was I talking about for the last 45 minutes? It's like, oh, my God. Um, no, this is this has been a dream come true. But the last <laughs> thing I want I want to ask you, is there yeah. any plans to reissue one of the rarest, most sought after punk records ever? That Oingo Boingo demo 10 inch. The Oingo Boingo demo 10 inch. Well, the demo there's different tenet. songs on it, right? Than than on the regular no, no, ten there's, inch. There's only one song. I mean, it was only a lad, uh, little girls, and then there was the song "Violent Love." And I'm trying to think of. Well, that's actually that's the ten inch that officially got reissued. I'm talking about the one that came out before, where there's only 140 copies, and it ain't this the life. Only a lad, forbidden zone, and I'm so bad, and it's one of the most sought after punk records out there. I I don't even know about this. There was a hundred, uh, 130 co copies done. Apparently, uh, Charlie, uh, Euclid painted the covers and, uh, they were handed out. Like they were just, and it's one of those incredibly sought after records because as you said, there's like different songs on the actual 10 inch that came out. But I didn't think Forbidden Zone was on there. Yeah, it was, uh, and there's been, I've only, I've seen one copy in person one time at, uh -huh. at someone's house, but other than that, it's like, you know, one of these records that only exists in whispers. It's like beyond the Beatles' Butcher Baby Sleeve. Yeah, I mean, we did it ourselves. We recorded it and we pressed these copies, and I remember, like, making a stencil and, like, hand spraying the covers, and that's the record that got to Jed the Fish on K-Rock, and that's where he picked up Only a Lad, and started playing it and kind of got caught on. And then IRS records came to us and said, hey, uh, let's do an EP. But then that EP, I guess it was slightly different. But that's where I'm not mm -hmm. remembering that. Uh, I, I thought it was the same four songs, but you're probably right, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible nerd about this stuff. And this has yeah. definitely been no, on the wall list for a long time now. I, I know that Only a Lad was on both because... Yes, yes, it was. Only a Lad was the song that Jed picked up from the 10-inch that got us signed to IRS, and then we did a, a another four-song EP. Um, 
but I guess the in that EP, Forbidden Zone fell off, and I, I don't know what took its place. So, you're and Forbidden Zone more. is such a good song. Like that song <laughs> is one of my favorites. Uh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was right at the junction between the Mystic Knights and Oingo Boingo's band. You know, right when the Mystic Knights was dissolving, almost completely gone, and Oingo Boingo was just starting up. But within a year of Forbidden Zone, there was no more Mystic Knights. They were dissolved. I've heard you describe, or I've heard actually Mystic Knights described as an old wave band. Was that something you guys were taking on kind of in, <laughs> in response to New Wave? No, no. I mean, there was no New Wave uh, when we were in the Mystic Knights. So, I mean, old wave meaning definitely old wave. Uh, look, in the 70s, when I was in the Mystic Knights, I didn't even want to listen to music recorded after 1938. <laughs> in my yes. mind, I lived in 1933, um, and I traveled between Paris and Harlem, and that's where my brain was. You know, it was going between the the jazz clubs in Harlem to the uh, jazz clubs in Paris, and um, and that's where I lived. You know, it's like I was into like weird, archaic shit, um, and you know. You probably have gotten the idea by now that I'm pretty OCD. So, like, when I went full throttle into that world, I really went into that world. Like, literally, when I came out of it at the end of the 70s and decided, oh, I'm going to start a ska band. And I remember hearing uh, Scary Monsters. Um, and that was, you know, L Lodger and Scary Monsters from David Bowie. And Scary Monsters is still, like, the most influential album in my past, other than maybe, mm. you know... Abbey Road or something from the Beatles. But uh, when I heard that, I said, God, who is this amazing guy? Like he was a new artist. <laughs> and it's like, dude, this Bowie's been around for the last 12 years. You've never heard of Ziggy Stardust? I'm going, no, who's that? <laughs> and I, I was like totally removed from American pop culture in the 70s until I suddenly burst into, ah, I want to be in a, I want to be in a ska band. And suddenly it's like, wow, man, this album's amazing. And, um, and our, the same year, I, I, see, I feel like I heard Madness, Selector, The Specials, David Bowie, and XTC. And it's like, that's it. It's like, I'm out of here. And suddenly I just like totally moved my headspace, like transformed. And that's kind of like the story of my life. It's like, I wake up and it's like, everything I've been doing for the last five or 10 or 15 or 30 years suddenly becomes like, why, why, why was I doing that? I want to do this now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, it's amazing too. Cause like watching that old footage of you guys, it's just how like, obviously, yeah, you're talking about the influences you had, but at the same time, it's such a, such a cool, different aesthetic. Like even the gong show footage of you guys, like it feels like Gary Panter meets your vibe is kind of that, that is the Tim Burton Pee Wee Herman. Yeah, I mean, aesthetic. it was just crazy street theater is what yeah. it was. And it's funny, we went on the gong show it, wanting to get gonged. <laughs> and my brother had his rocket ship on, the one he used to use to put out peep flames when I was breathing fire and I'd start fire on people's like backs, you know, from yeah. little droplets. Um, and he was ready to blast the whole crew, their whole judging panel with CO2. And to his horror... We won, <laughs> and, and it's like, well, wait a minute. We missed that fun moment of blasting the the judges on the gong show with CO2 in a cloud of CO2. That that was the point of going on there, was to get gonged. So it, it oh. kind of didn't didn't quite go as we expected. But that that's that's what we were that's where we were at at the time. It's like, yes, please gong us. <laughs> In the very beginning of the performance, it feels like it might go that way. But by the end, that is the most spectacular music performance ever on TV. Like, I don't know why that thing is not more celebrated, just uh, obviously independent of your career, just as being like, what a gonzo moment of music on television. Well, that I don't know. I mean, look, I can't watch it. So I'm glad it's not any more known than it is because it's like, you know, it's like, it's, I look back at it and go, oh, fuck, really? But, you know, we can't run from our past. It is what it is. And uh, so it was where I was at at that point in my life. You know, it's like 
playing trombone, blowing fire, doing crazy shit, and hoping to bust uh, a, a CO2 cart uh, machine all over Buddy Hackett. <laughs> well, past, present, and future, we really appreciate you here, Danny. All right. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you. Thank you, Danny, for coming on the show. And when he comes back for that part two, I'm going to hit him with that how'd you get in a punk question. Save it for the sequel. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. We didn't have a lot of time. You know, they gave me a short window, and I was like, all right. I got a whole list I had to get to. Got to some of it, but I got that part two. He promised. He promised. And I'm going to promise you that the next episode of this podcast is well worth your time because coming back to the show... One of my favorite guests ever. And if you have if you have not heard his part one, you are missing out on one of the one of the all-time Turn Into Punk episodes. Chris Gethard is coming back to the show in celebration of his new comedy special. Uh, he's a very funny guy. Uh, an amazing... Um, uh, we get, you're, if you do not know Chris Gethard, familiarize yourself with Chris Gethard. Uh, listen to his part one, because this part two... Uh, It's a fun one. It is a fun one. And that is that. Remember, as always, black lives matter. The lives of indigenous people matter. We need to protect trans kids. We need to help trans people protect themselves. Um, We need to stop hate and violence towards people of Asian descent and Asian people. Uh, We need to just, just fucking smash fascism. You heard. If Danny Elfman, if the guy that wrote the Simpsons theme song is freaking out about the way the world is right now. You know, you got to be freaking out about the way the world is right now. Uh, these aren't political issues. You know, Danny kind of said this too. This Danny said this too. These aren't political issues. These are human rights issues. Um, and we all need to, to realize that. Um, uh, go out there, sign your organ donor cards, because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need them anymore. Just literally dead weight. Get this shit out of me. You would say, if you could talk, but you wouldn't be able to because you would be dead. So, you know, just donate those organs. It, it helps. It really does help other people. Um, you have to sign that card in advance. You can't, you know, it's a process. But look into it. Look into it. Donate those organs. Donate blood if you can, too. There's a shortage in people uh, donating blood as well. Uh, do something creative for yourself. After all this morbid uh, talk of dying and donating your organs, you know, maybe you're a little stressed out. Well, we'll try drawing a picture, <laughs> try making a podcast, try starting a band. All this stuff gives me anxiety thinking about. So maybe don't do that. No, do it, do it. It might help. It might help. Speaking of might help. You tried meditating. I didn't believe in that bullshit. And then I tried it. And now I swear it is amazing. Try it. Just try it. What the fuck? What's the worst? What's the worst that could happen to you? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. Try it. It'll make you look cool. Meditate. Um, I think that's it, right? All right. See you next episode. It's a good one. I love you. Bye. Listen to Oil and Flowers. Hosted by Buddha Blaze and myself. Uh, you can find it where you find your podcast like this one. It's about cannabis. If you enjoy cannabis, you'll enjoy it. If you don't, maybe you'll maybe you learn something. I'm not trying to get you into it if you don't want to be in it though. You know. Bye for real now. <laughs>